The host for this evening will be Dr. Martina Murphy, uh, the Associate Head of the School of Architecture for the Belfast School of Architecture and the Built Environment at University of Ulster. Uh, Martina is a chartered architect who spent 15 years in practice in the UK and Hong Kong before doing a doctorate in 2004 on the implementation of design innovations in construction. She's currently the Director of Studies for the BA and Masters of Architecture program at Ulster and sits on a number of advisory public and charity boards, including the Royal Society of Archite Ulster Architects uh, since 2000. Dr. Murphy is a member of the editorial board of the International Review Board of ArcNet, AJAR International Journey, Journal of Architectural Research, MIT Press, and reviewer for a number of peer reviewed journals. Uh, Martina, welcome, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks, Frank, for that for that welcome. Um, and this is to uh, Women at the Edge event. Um, so already 11 has have gone before us and they've been uh, super for those of you that have had a chance to, to go in and see them. Uh, so this event is part of Architecture at the Edge, hence uh, maybe the, the title. So we're delighted that uh, you could join us. So as Franca says, my name is Martina Murphy and I'm your chair for this evening's event. And it's an evening we hope of easy conversation, uh, discussion, enlightenment uh, for some of us, uh, but one which we hope uh, you will all enjoy and join in and ask questions and share ideas uh, for discussion. Uh, we're gonna meet three hugely talented uh, female architects uh, from across uh, the island, uh, ranging from the arts, uh, from professional practice, from academia, uh, construction, uh, Olympic sports, movie stars, you name it, we have it. So as I say to, uh, to my students, uh, move down from the back, fill up the front and, and, and pull up your seat, uh, turn off the phone and, and pick up the popcorn and, uh, and off we go. Well, maybe not the popcorn for health and safety reasons, but, uh, but ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to listen to our, uh, our hugely talented uh, offering this evening. So shortly, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists, uh, but just to set the context uh, for a moment of uh, At The Edge. So I come from Newry and, uh, and a dear and uh, lovely friend uh, said to me uh, from that part of the world, uh, they said, so, so if I tune in to this Sunday evening, are all these like people, like women on the edge? And uh, so I thought maybe a little bit of clarity needed here. On the edge, at the edge, let's clarify. So this evening we're not talking on the edge and all uh, the connotation, but we're talking at the edge. And a uh, little bit of research would tell us when you're at the edge, Perhaps we can see what others can't see. We can see beyond. We have perspective that again, maybe others can't see. And this may allow us to make measured and important decisions and address challenges with those hindsights. So the women at the edge this evening are gonna share some of those. So with that in mind, I've asked the three panelists this evening to present a short overview of their personal journeys into architecture, their life experiences, ambitions, interests, passions. And then I've asked them if they would share with us a particular at the edge moment, maybe an experience, a challenge, whatever at the edge looks like to them. So let's get going. So first I'm gonna introduce the, the panelists. So uh, Tara, Tara Kennedy is our first um, architect this evening. So Tara uh, practices and teaches architecture. She's a lecturer at Cork Center for Architectural Education and is currently in practice with John McLaughlin architects. Now, I found a wonderful 
image of Tara, which I'm sure she won't mind me sharing. So lovely image, setting, context, uh, even colors, beautiful, uh, which I thought I'd like to share. I think it's class. But my question is, is that Hugh Grant? I don't know. I don't know. I'm thinking Tara, Hugh, movie house cinema, social distancing. I'm not sure. I don't know. So those are the questions we need to ask. Awkward questions, and that's why we're here. Yeah, in Tara in uh, 2018, uh, Tara co-founded the practice uh, Culture Construction, and she was also a founder of the community-based design organization Commonage. And more recently, Tara was co-curator of the Irish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, which we know entitled Free Market. That's Tara. Jane, Jane Norma. Jane, I've known for uh, many years. Now, Jane is a unique conundrum of delight, of elegance, articulate, sublime, beautiful, but deadly talent. So do not be deceived of this talent this evening. Hugely talented uh, architect. Uh, again, I'd like to share uh, the image this evening. So I'm thinking Withering Heights meets Mona Lisa. You know what I'm saying? Lovely, but do not be deceived. Jane holds a first class honors from Queens and GCD and was awarded the two highest student awards in Ireland the RSUA President's Medal and the RIAI President's Medal postgrad, as well as uh, RIAI Travel Scholarship. Jane is a lecturer at Queen's and a part three examiner. And she's a director and co-founder of Arrigo Larma uh, Wheeler Architects. And the practice was recently awarded second place in the international competition for the Irish Embassy in Tokyo. Jane also sits on the RSUA Council and is the regionally elected council rep on our IBA Council. Jane, lovely. And last but not least is Ashlyn, Ashlyn Rusk. I read a paper recently just to share by a, a professor at, uh, at Princeton and it was entitled, Why Women still can't have it all. And as I read it, and sipped my one shot cappuccino, the weight of expectations, responsibilities, and aspirations lifted. I can't do it all. And then I met Ashley. And there always has to be one. The one that can do it all. So Ashlyn is director of the Practice Studio at Door. Uh, she is the chair of the RSUA Women in Architecture, championing all forms of diversity in architecture. Ashlyn competed for Northern Ireland in the surf kayak team at the World Championships in Costa Rica. She has cycled around Ireland to, to reconnect with her country after studying away, visiting every coastal town and city on the way, northern, eastern, southern and westerly most points over three weeks. Ashlyn has a PhD in which she has explored spatial practices that I hope we look at this evening that navigate margins and boundaries as spaces of opportunity. This interest in, in liminal practice, we hope we can explore is interwoven into our own work and is especially um, resonant in a recently completed project for one of Belfast Peace Walls. During lockdown, she started writing daily poems uh, by way of processing and recording uh, the times that we're in. So hopefully we'll hear some of those this evening. 
and hopefully we won't come away too discouraged at all of those uh, achievements and uh, she may grind us a little bit uh, as we as we hear her speak so again once again thank you for the panelists this evening so uh, tara and jane and ashley so i'm going to ask each of you to share your presentations and then i'm going to open to the floor for questions and please feel free to share ideas ask questions and uh, and we'll have a discussion from that so can i ask thank you for uh, tara if you'd like to share your presentation sure thank you um... <clears throat> Okay, is that sharing now? Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, thanks for the introductions, Martina. Um, so um, I suppose I was going to start off um, talking a little bit about the way that I work, which usually involves doing lots of different things at the same time. And I suppose um, I think one of the things about that uh, means that it remain towards the edge of each of those things and have a little bit of, of what Martina, I suppose, was talking about where you're able to see the boundaries of something um, and maybe see how uh, the things that others don't see um, and maybe continue to ask questions about the things that you're doing. Um, and then also think about the kind of overlaps and, and the power and the overlaps between those things. So um, at the moment, the things that I do uh, include teaching. So uh, in the, the middle of the screen on the top there, that's a field trip last year when, when these things were still possible to uh, with um, a group of second year students that I was teaching in Cork um, to a place called Valdaura, which is uh, an amazing um, lab just outside Barcelona. Um, then to the right of that is a site visit image of a recent project that I, I've um, been working on with John McLaughlin Architects, so uh, hands-on uh, building projects. Then the bottom left uh, is an image from Free Market, so often there'll be some kind of self-initiated or collaborative research project that I'll be working on. Um, and then I have two small children, so uh, I think it's always important that that's uh, a part of the way that my day-to-day uh, -day is structured and the way that I structure the way that, that I practice. Um, and then kind of from that, what, what I'm going to do, um, so was, Martina had asked us to think about one moment of being at the edge, um, but then we had talked about maybe taking five minutes or about five slides to, to talk, um, each of us, and I thought that maybe I'd think about five different um, experiences of being at the edge and how those kind of might bring me up to where I am now. Um, so <clears throat> The first of those is um, the first of those came before I started uh, into studying architecture before I became an architect. Um, so my background is in visual arts to begin with. I initially studied sculpture at NCAD, um, and just after I finished studying scu studying sculpture. Uh, one of the projects that I did um, as an artist was I was artist in residence in an architect's office as part of um, an RSUA run project called Two Minds um, back in 2006. Uh, and I thought it was kind of a good one to mention in the context of where who I was talking to and where we were talking this evening. So um, and in that project, I suppose what was really apparent to me uh, at that moment in time was uh, it seemed from the outset like it would be exactly the ideal project that I would want to work on. I was an artist, I was really interested in built environment, I was interested in architecture, um, but I realized I felt at the edge and not in a positive way. I felt like I was kind of outside of the things that I really wanted to do and wanted to be interested in and that was kind of a key moment for me in deciding that actually rather than just being an artist with a strong interest in architecture, I wanted to study architecture and be able to kind of come at it from the inside out. Um, and so then this next image is um, an, an early project, uh, 2010 project from um, the Practice Culture Instruction, which is a collaborative practice between myself and Joanne Butler. This is a loitering platform we built in a small town called Callan in County Kilkenny. Um, and I suppose the next kind of 
um, thought I had on this idea of, of edge was being in college studying architecture um, with the background that I had in visual arts and thinking about how um, I suppose this idea of being on the edge as being able to see in and out. Um, so I was kind of inside something and outside something at the same time. So I felt like it had a different perspective from other people who were studying uh, architecture with me at the same time, having come from the background that, that I had come from. Um, but also I was kind of within that. So it was this kind of powerful position of being able to question things. Um, and um, I was lucky to be doing that with some with a friend who also had studied sculpture with me before. And um, we kind of had independently ended up together studying architecture. Um, and so we began to work collaboratively doing things that were projects kind of um, driven by the things that we saw that weren't happening maybe within architecture school or things that we were questioning about architectural education. And um, so that's, uh, I suppose, this idea of being able to see in and out and question things. Um, and both of us became involved as well in initiating a project called Commonage, which is a, um, I suppose, a design research organization based in this same small town of Callan in County Kilkenny. And we ran a number of projects in that town over um, between 2010 up to 2013. Um, and one of those, um, this is a, a shared meal in a space that we had built in a disused co-op in the center of Callan. Um, and a, a number of those projects were run as design and build summer schools. So one of the things that was important there, I think, was the idea of um, thinking about ways of working um, and what the kind of edges of what was architecture practice. So thinking about the actual act of building as part of uh, the practice of design and um, thinking about building as collective act, thinking about participatory practice. And um, so those were some of the things that informed, uh, I suppose, the, the summer school that we ran um, as part of Commonage. Um, then this is uh, that same project, and this is me in very appropriate site gear, um, drilling something on site. Um, but I suppose one of the things that I, I thought was maybe important also to highlight and maybe feed into the discussion this evening was um, the, the gender position I was in. So being a woman studying architecture, um, it also felt like it was even harder than maybe for other students uh, to get construction experience and to become really hands-on involved in, in building. And um, so this kind of questioning of um, gender-based structures is something that has always been part of, of my practice as well. Um, and that as, as, um, as things have developed, as my life has changed, this has gone on to become something that has um, been part of a discussion with a group called the Mothership Project, who are a group of parenting artists primarily, um, and I uh, and visual arts workers, various different types of, of arts workers. Um, and so I have been working with the Mothership Project um, over a number of years. It began as a conversation once I had children that was, um, for me, started as being about the kind of spaces that we share and how your access to space changes as a parent, um, but also about the kind of structures of work um, and I suppose inherent um, inequalities that there are. Uh, so with the Mothership Project um, last year, we published uh, um, a big survey about the conditions for parenting um, artists and I suppose looking at kind of structural inequalities um, that there are when you become a parent as a creative worker. Um, and then the last project uh, or the last kind of moment or edge condition um, that I wanted to mention was working as part of Free Market, um, which was the Irish representation at Venice in 2018, and um, subsequently a, a national touring pavilion in Ireland in 2019. Um, and so I suppose there was two things I just wanted to highlight about that from this, uh, from this with this question of, of um, edge conditions in mind. So one of them was to do with the subject matter that we chose for this big project and um, pavilion and, and then touring exhibition, which was to do with uh, small towns, which I suppose um, we felt were maybe at the edge of mainstream architectural debate or a little bit outside mainstream architectural debate, um, I suppose, urban life and city living is, is maybe at the core. And, and then there's another area of debate and kind of um, idealized 
rural architecture maybe and that, that towns were something overlooked so this in a way it was a something that was kind of at the edge of debate um, and then also within that project the idea of ways of working um, and uh, the idea of kind of working in a non-hierarchical collaborative team structure where there were six members all working together um, and that a part of the work that we did on that project was to um, set up structures and to work together uh, to, to think about how you would um, how you would work in this way that was non-hierarchical and collaborative and maybe thinking that that's slightly an edge condition um, within architecture which can be something that is uh, quite hier hierarchical in structure um, and maybe celebrates single authorship or celebrates um, uh, one person's name being put to, to a project so uh, this was another kind of idea I, I suppose a moment of edge condition that I thought I wanted to mention and I think I've probably gone way over um, five minutes but I suppose what I was trying to do was maybe provoke some thoughts um, around the, the topic um, with a little bit of background uh, um, to my own practice. Thank you Ara. excellent thank you very much and Jane up next thank you. Thanks, Martina. Um, and thanks, Tara. That was lovely to see your work um, and how you've got here. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, Martina, thanks for that very generous introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, as I think we've known each other probably from 15 years or so, and uh, our paths have crossed a number of times in, in studios. Um, really, I'm going to start really by, I suppose, saying a few words about why I'm studying art or why I studied architecture, why I'm doing architecture, being involved in architecture. Um, it was a very natural choice for me as a career. I enjoyed art at school. Um, I enjoyed going to see buildings as a child with my parents and um, my dad, an architectural historian for um, working at Queen's for about 40 years. So I was no stranger to either the studios there or um, beautiful buildings and spaces and places ac across the world that, that I was fortunate enough to be taken to as a child. And my grandfather had been an architect as well. So. I was really encouraged um, from quite a young age that architecture was something you could do as a career. I never really realised that there was anything um, unusual about that for a woman um, and was constantly handed cuttings um, from the press about um, architects in Ireland who were, you know, making great, uh, great work. Um, and it looked like something I really would like to, to do. Um, I think really for me, the edge of architecture is about the excitement of, of knowing that you can make a difference, you can change things, you can make things better for people. Um, and really, I suppose, being in places and um, getting to experience the good effects of architecture, really, that excitement, I suppose, for me is really um, what I enjoy. Um, I mentioned I really enjoyed art at school and um, to me a very easy way of communicating and um, working through ideas and showing and communicating ideas um, and that's something that I make time for um, not just for pleasure um, now as an architect but as part of my work um, and I think that kind of freedom and looseness and ability to um, try things out and test things out and make starters for conversation is um, something that I really enjoy and enjoy passing on to my own students now. Um, at the last, uh, in the last recession, um, I had worked for both Hall McKnight and O'Donnell and Toomey um, and had great um, experience in both their studios over the years and um, really working on competitions, which again, I suppose is an, an you know, the edge or the excitement of architecture for me and um, wondering, you know, is it going to be this time? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, after the, during the last recession, um, after I finished my work with O'Donnell and Toomey, um, it was a, 
were an opportunity really to go and teach. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been taught by practicing architects in both Northern Ireland and, and in, in Dublin when I studied there. And I really appreciated the honesty and openness um, that uh, I, people involved in, in teaching architecture who were also working brought to the studio and wanted to, to be able to pass that on myself. My teaching role at Queen's now, I've been there for 10 years, um, really allows me to bring in both my construction experience and also um, I teach, in, as Martina said, in the professional practice course as an examiner um, and also contributing to lots of, uh, sort of extracurricular things like watercolour classes and um, really just exploring the, the breadth of architecture as a, as a, as a discipline um, and the different ways that we can contribute. Um, I think that I see a couple of familiar faces um, from, from Queen's on here um, and uh, I've taught with Martina at the University of Austria over the years as well. Um, the last recession for me um, was, uh, as I said, a, a great opportunity to explore teaching, which I hadn't been able to do in, in practice until that point. Um, but it was also a great time to sort of stop and think about um, research and history and all of the work that's come before the work that we get the opportunity to do now. Um, and undertook some research at Ulster University. Um, looking at baths and bathing places around Ireland and getting to um, just explore the, the sort of finer grain of edge and boundary um, between water and land um, on a sort of practical and, and philosophical level. Again, this is something I was able to bring into to teaching um, in the studios um, with my own students and uh, contributed to a number of publications as well on that. Uh, the time then sort of being out of practice um, in a formal sense um, alongside teaching gave, gave, gave me an opportunity to explore you know, bigger public work that I had been used to in former practice um, through competitions. Um, the European competition which is held across Europe for um, young practitioners was a really good opportunity for myself and um, Patrick and, and Mark to think about you know, the possibility of working together despite living across um, different parts of this island um, and in 2016 we I suppose took a jump and um, Mark first then Patrick and then myself um, and set up Argo Lama Wheeler Architects firstly in Dublin and then in Belfast um, that's been um, that's us in our studio in, in Dublin and, and in Belfast there um, like many practices across Ireland, um, most of our work until this point has been working on domestic projects, new houses, extensions, um, which has been, I think, is a really important aspect of practice, working with people who live in these places and making really big um, impacts in their day-to-day -day lives. The relationships you have with clients um, in domestic practice is really quite special. And alongside that, you know, we have been thinking of ways to try and uh, get some of that larger scale work that we're, we're also used to and which so many other practitioners across Ireland are used to from, from previous practice. And so the recent um, competition for Ireland House as a, a really positive opportunity for practices of our scale and, and, and age to try and contribute to public work and um, the competition being set up to allow collaborations um, gave us an opportunity to, to work with a practice we, we knew well from previous practice and um, these were some of the images from from our second place entry which was announced just a week or so ago so we're hoping that um, with you know some of the contributors to we can build better are online here and we're hopeful that the progress that um, they have made tara included um allows uh practices like ourselves to to get more involved in this scale of work jane thank you very much so interesting thank you um uh, next can i ask ashlyn to present Thank you, Jane. 
Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Martina, for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, don't really know what to say. Uh, but um, yeah, and but thank you, Jane and Tara. I absolutely loved hearing your talks and all the different ways that you have uh, explored the different definitions of edges. It's really rich. So I'm going to really hurry up and try and say my bit so we can have the discussion afterwards. Um, I will present a few slides along the way, but I'm just going to chat initially. Uh, so yeah, I'm Ashling, Director of Studio Editor, uh, Irish word for in between, between um, Mold by Edges and Boundaries. Uh, we're a Belfast based practice for the minute, uh, working a combination of residential uh, work and collaborations with creative businesses, business clients to shape their home and workspaces, which as we all know, are of course increasingly one and the same this year as that the boundary between the domestic and the workplace begins to erode. Um, or has been eroded by the coronavirus. Uh, speaking of which, domestic, I am also, and just as importantly, like the other two speakers, uh, a mother to two young kids, Finian, who's six, and Meredith, who's four. Uh, and I'm a researcher. My PhD, as Martina mentioned, uh, put forward a theory of liminal spatial praxis, um, which I spoke about yesterday. Uh, so I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much. Um, it's literally a theory that explores boundaries in contested places like Northern Ireland and Israel, Palestine and the things people do to disrupt and transgress them, seeking connection rather than division. Um, these boundaries can be physical between different places, uh, but also between different formal and informal, for example, practices and ways of knowing space, for example, from an expert, like an architect producing maps and plans to you know somebody uh, like a local form of knowledge that you get from being in a space or working in it or walking through it every day um, knows that would make you know a space with an int intimacy that no map can capture. Uh, so I've got a lot to say about edges. Um, for me, edges are a space of creative opportunity because there were one place physical or ideological meets another. Um, and from where you get a better view of the whole, as Tara was saying, um, and what's beyond it than you do at the center. I'm really inspired by the writings of Bell Hooks on this. Um, and she refers to boundaries as margins in her writing and she puts it way better than me. Um, and really again, like, like Tara was describing, but uh, she says to be in the margin is to be a part of the whole, but outside the main body. Uh, she describes growing up in a Kentucky town where the black people live beyond the railway line um, and could cross the railway line only to work in the rich people's houses and then had to leave again. Um, they therefore got to know what happened inside and outside uh, two perspectives. So she speaks of choosing to see marginal space as a quote, not a site of domination, but a place of resistance. I am speaking from a place in the margins where I am different, where I see things differently. Speaking from the margins, speaking in resistance, marginality as a site of resistance, enter that space, she urges, let us meet there, enter that space. Uh, that's from her three-page essay called Marginality as a Site of Resistance that I would encourage you all to read. And I asked Rosie to put a link to a PDF of it online if anybody wants to check it out on the chat. Um, so these are the sort of examples I was sticking out in my research. Um, people using edge as a space of creativity and connection. Women are great at this. Um, following on from my PhD, I'm currently working to find ways to kind of push the boundaries of traditional architectural practice and find new ways to engage in spaces where architects might not typically be found, um, such as the literal physical boundaries that are oxymoronically up here, known as known of as peace walls. Um, and hold on a sec, just got a few slides, ignore the text on that, forgot to delete it. Um, so uh, this is a project we did earlier this year uh, with consultancy Starling Start coming up with design concepts for the beautification or eventual removal of a 650 meter long, nine meter high, 40 year old Belfast peace wall or fence in this case, in this part of it. Um, crucially, these ideas had to emerge from conversations with local residents. We were told at the start that we would need to have separate meetings on either side of the wall in some community center or other because people wouldn't come to a joint event and neither were they likely to speak to us if we went door to door. So we came up with an idea for a mobile shared space uh, that would come to them on around the streets they lived on. Uh, we put invites through letter boxes, hired a glorious yellow vintage camper van called Daisy, stuck our models in it and our drawings on it, had colouring in and model making for the kids, Daisy badges for everyone. Um, and we asked people what they wanted to happen to their wall, the one their garden backed onto, and took their answers seriously to input into our proposals. Even those who asked that the nine metre fence be replaced with a wall the same size and brick. So we drew that up to demonstrate the prison like permanence of it that by contrast made the metal fence they have look positively tame. 
uh, especially if you painted something on it, like a continuous wrap around 1.3 kilometer public mural, or, you know, which is one of the proposals we put forward, could be scenery, could be poetry, Irish poets um, in dialogue. Uh, so um, these are the various sort of things we came up with. Um, so Daisy was a shared space and experience, even if it wasn't shared by everyone at once, it was a mem memorable creative happening that literally drew an ephemeral connecting circle in its route around a dividing wall. 89 people came and engaged with us and it was a, it was a wonderful process and it was about a week or so later, Northern Ireland went into lockdown. Um, so this is my story of being at the edge before the many edges that this pandemic and the lockdown has presented us all with and which interestingly to me as someone who for some years now has worked so hard to erode boundaries has led to a period of searching for ways to establish and maintain important boundaries between different parts of my life uh, which has become more challenging this year so not letting work take over not letting the kids run wild keeping a two meter then one meter social distance which is a term i find equally as oxymoronic as a peace wall uh, away from everybody else. Uh, so from a starting point for me of seeking to challenge boundaries at every opportunity, it's been six months or so of creating and maintaining many, many boundaries and new edges. Um, and one of the things that I did, as Martina mentioned, to have a creative outlet and lockdown was to write a poem every day that helped me record and make sense of what was going on. I'm not a poet, except in as much as I believe we all are. Um, as William Stafford said, everyone is born a poet, a person discovering the way words sound and work, caring and delighting in words. I just kept on doing what other people started out doing. The real question is, why did everyone else stop? Um, I thought I'd finish then uh, very quickly by uh, taking myself to the very, very edge of my comfort zone and sharing one of those poems that's about a certain type of boundary and also about the connections across and as my homage to Robert Cross Mendingwall, a favourite of mine, uh, in which he's fixing a boundary wall with his neighbour. Uh, this is also, this poem's also an ode to the sanctuary many of us found working in our gardens during lockdown. It's called The Loppers and it's from 14th of April 2020. Um, so today we tackled the hedges, our neighbour on his side across the divide, he with his loppers aloft a ladder, snipping, us pulling, cutting, branches piling up unwieldy. In the country we'd light a bonfire, he loves the smell of green leaves burning, Finian loves the fire, but here in the city we'll order a skip. So pleasing the resultant straight line, long view, Meredith nestled in a thicket absorbed, weaving bracelets from grass in her velvet sequined dress, elfin garden girl. My turn with the loppers then, passed over the conquered hedge to tackle the back boundary, satisfying the snip, snip, pull, long handles giving powerful leverage, opening up the view, surrounding myself in toppled branches, then dragging them, a mound in the front of garden, arms scratched, hands raw, muscles tired, thirsty work. It's a job well done. That's me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. Um, raw passion. Uh, so interesting and um, I think hopefully we can maybe explore uh, that concept of liminality uh, that you mentioned uh, in and through your PhD because that was news to me, uh, hugely interesting. Um, I'm just going to ask a few questions and then I'd like to, to open it up to the, to the floor. Um, we've had a, a, a range of views and yet there, there's a commonality there, I think, in all our, our, um, our panelists this evening. Uh, really interesting, Tara speaking about that range of edge conditions in her life, from being a parent, uh, to being a builder, to being a visual artist, uh, to seeking to change a hierarchical structure of how we work together. So actually, many strands of her life engaging in challenging those, those edge conditions. Um, Jane, uh, intrinsic sense of belonging to architecture from the very outset. I find that hugely interesting considering we challenge uh, young females so often to come into architecture um, when it's just not what they're maybe told or historically seen as a career path and yet historically through, um, through her parents and her father and uh, engaging with universities and studios from a very early age, that intrinsic sense of belonging to architecture, which actually eroded, it seemed to me, to erode that, that edge condition, uh, which we find very challenging to bring uh, women into, uh, girls, young ladies, into, into architecture. 
uh, and, and Ashlyn, um, for me, that uh, liminality is possibly about what it is to be at the edge, but it's understanding what we're moving from and, and moving to, uh, I think is, is maybe worth exploring a little bit, uh, if we can do that. Um, you mentioned some of your research uh, previously in other contexts. Can you suggest for us, what are you bringing uh, to this context, to the research that you're working on at the minute from other global contexts or other conditions of a state of being such as lockdown and, and, and COVID and so forth? What are those lessons that we can learn maybe for the boundaries within the research in, in against the peace walls that you could bring, bring to that? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's funny, it's one of those things, I think sometimes we start to do a piece of research or maybe as an architect we start to do research. I don't know about, I studied, didn't study in, in Ireland, um, but uh, you know, I didn't come out of my master's really having the same knowledge about how to do academic research as you get if you do more of a research-based master's, architecture so practical. So, you know, I kind of went into it probably thinking I could just design some good solutions for things. And actually, when you start getting into complicated questions, you realize there's not simple answers. There isn't a sort of one size fits all approach that you can take in these complex contested environments. Um, but the things that I drew from what I looked at, the practices or spatial stories that I looked at in Israel and Palestine and, and in Northern Ireland, around having, you know, letting go of your, your ego or your own agenda and being open to other ways of working. And that's getting to the edge of your knowledge and where it interfaces with local knowledge and other people's ways of knowing and practicing space um, around just locating, being present on, on, as I spoke about a little bit yesterday, but making yourself present in your practice on an interface or a border to, because your presence and your productivity can, ignite other things um there's loads it wasn't you know so i didn't i did not conclude my phd with a, a manual for how to do this work but there's just lots of commonalities you can draw from really different practices that are around seeking connection sharing um being using tactics you using humor uh yeah just being playful experimenting trial and error i could go on and on but that's the idea <laughs> just Lovely. Thank, thank you, Ashlyn. And, and Tara, could I ask you actually to pick up on that? Because that's really interesting in terms of that uh, boundary between what we, we, we know, maybe what we think we know, and giving that space to others to share what they know, because I'm, I'm conscious you picked up a little bit on that in your non-hierarchical ways of working, perhaps. Yeah, I think um, I found it really interesting, Ashlyn, talking about um, this idea of creating and maintaining boundaries and wanting to put up boundaries in the last six months or so. And I think one of the things that I think is, um, I suppose, a really important part of any type of collaborative or participatory practice is just the idea of honesty um, and honesty uh, to have an agenda and that your agenda might be different to somebody else's and things like that. And so I think this idea of uh, and, and being honest about where the edge of your knowledge is and somebody else's begins and I think that's something uh it was just when you were talking about this idea of creating and maintaining new boundaries I found it really interesting because I think there's been this huge level of new connection with people around us that's happened in the last six months with the people that are like in immediate proximity proximity to you even if you have to stay two, two meters apart from them everybody has a sudden this kind of increased awareness of each other's um of the structure of your lives and of these boundaries that you may need to create and maintain or may need to break down so i think that i just thought that was really interesting um, and um i suppose it was interesting to hear you talk about bell hooks and i think kind of feminist approaches are often really useful in thinking about the uh, edge condition and marginality and boundaries and all these things um but uh, i've lost my train of thought there now uh, it was something I wanted to say about um, this idea of honesty and boundaries. It'll come back to me. Uh, honesty. Yeah. Oh, I think, sorry, it was just to say that I, I think, I suppose, um, when I began with kind of, you know, setting out, I do this, that and the other thing. And one of those things is parenting. I think um, 
this idea about the boundaries between domestic life and work life eroding. And obviously there are many problematics around that, but I think when you share those eroding boundaries, then it can only be positive for creating better environments for people to live their day-to-day -day lives and, and being more honest about how people's day-to-day -day lives look also uh, is really positive in terms of architectural and spatial practice. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. I agree entirely, Tara. Um, and and I'm thinking, Jane, uh, can I bring you in here in terms of expanding that in your own experience? Um, again, I know you have these, these um, range of edges that you've worked on, these range of challenges that you've taken on, but in and through this, there just seems to be that strand of, of introspection and understanding in terms of your academic work, in terms of how you move forward professionally, and in understanding the value of uh, smaller entities of that. You talk about the house and paintings and waterlands. What are your experiences of, um, of meeting those edge conditions and how they change our, our behaviours? Um, well, just to pick up on a couple of points that that both Tara and Ashling have mentioned there, which I would, I would agree with, on um, the experience of the last few months that everybody has had. Um, I think um, for Mark and Patrick and myself, the way we set our studio up initially, we wanted to remain in our home cities of Belfast and Dublin. We very much wanted to work together um, and wanted to find a way to do that. So we, we set up by, you know, traveling and then, finding that we would work online quite a lot. So I think the, the practice experience of the last few months has been quite seamless for us um, in being able to just continue working the way we did. Um, obviously having to have children running around our feet at the same time um, added a, a little bit more of a challenge to it, but you know, it's, we're all practitioners and we're all parents. Um, and um, you know the resources of childcare and things like that were removed temporarily for us over the, the last period. Um, but I think there were some positives as well outside of practice to the whole kind of online situation, um, which continue now in, in teaching um, with a lot of our teaching having gone online within the space of a couple of days back in March. Um, which worked well. We had, you know, good relationships with our students and, and colleagues. But I actually saw more of my teaching colleagues over that period than I might normally have coming in as a part-time um, <clears throat> lecturer. So I thought that was really quite positive. And I think as well, one of the bigger issues is about diversity and in inclusivity in, in architecture and being able to attend university in person isn't always possible. I think the online um, setup does mean that people who have responsibilities and can't attend campus on a daily basis have been able to perhaps engage a little more than they might otherwise, um, even from other other countries. Um, so I think there's there's definitely a um, online overload <laughs> experience that can happen, but I do think there are some very positive things to have come out of that. Um, I think working for ourselves. Um, we have some degree of flexibility, especially as parents, um, in that we are answerable to each other. Larger practice where for many years, I think there's been a resistance or reluctance to allow people to work more flexible, flexibly. And we've all shown we can do it um, and have adapted to that. So I hope that both in terms of access to university experiences, um, the studio is so important and we hope that gradually comes back as we, as we know it. But I think in studio and practice, um, there may be some big shifts and changes that, that are actually quite positive. Can I ask Jane maybe, well, I'm going to open it to the floor. Actually, there's too many questions for me to ask. Um, can I open to the floor for the moment? Uh, if there's any questions, we have a chat, uh, chat room. I'll give folk a minute to ask a question. Sorry, I lost you there. Yeah, no worries.
So yes, please add your questions in the chat room. Um, so while we're, we're waiting and uh, perhaps typing, um, I'm going to ask a question. So I keep clicking between. So it's uh, it's not as seamless as when you're in the classroom. <laughs> um, um, so I'm thinking um, the the event is is women at the edge, uh, and I suppose the the title in itself is 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 somewhat more pointed in that uh, it is a more diverse um, working community that we're working within. Um, but we, you are three uh, three females within that, and uh, and there's a not only a triangle of of work of life of, of personal and balance um, what are some of the uh, the themes in drawing together all of those on the edge conditions as tara uh, called it um, that you could draw um, as being a, a female in the in the current in the current climate both in terms of education and in terms of of work life balance can I ask Ashlyn? Sorry, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question. Can you ask it again? Sorry, what are the edges that we experience as women? Is that yes? So, so some of the edges that you mentioned. Uh, how have you drawn some of the experiences from that um, into your your day to day life, and that you could share as a um, as a female within the within the profession? Like what has changed from the last six months or from the yes. experience of the veggies? Um, well, let's see. Yeah, I mean, like, I agree that, like Jane was just saying, that the everything moving digital has made it a lot more possible to be in two places at once, you know, to actually be attending things that you couldn't otherwise have made it to while your kids are, you know, those blessed moments where actually just both playing nicely with Playmobil and don't need anything from you. Uh, so it did, you know, it's definitely made made it possible to do more things at once but the problem is you know you very kindly introduced me as somebody who manages to, to do everything uh, or something and uh, I you know the fact is I have no more time than anybody else if I seem to be doing a lot of the things I seem to be doing a lot of it's because I'm not doing some other stuff like looking after myself resting sleeping enough um so those are the, that's when I was talking about maintaining boundaries uh you know creating them for me it was the the risk of slipping into kind of workaholism where you just get up in the morning and do a bit of work and then as long as the kids are entertained you're just back on doing the email here and there so um that's the, the one I just for me is still a work in progress it was actually just making myself stop when the it's all a bit more fluid um you know the boundaries between your work and your home time um uh i don't i'm not sure i'm really answering your question very well i don't know if you want to hand over to somebody else or uh no that's uh, that's lovely it's uh i mean there's there's a real depth in what you you explained in terms of your your phd and uh you defined that the the outcomes of that was about how people interact um, and sometimes we've only had to interact with ourselves over over lockdown or with a very small number of people. Um, so suddenly you've been taken out of, of, of the research you were doing and the wider practice environment that you were doing. And suddenly it's can we translate those uh, same methods and um, techniques and ways of working with a wider body of people to just maintaining that balance uh, for ourselves. And in ourselves and um i don't know tara is there um i'm conscious you worked with uh with a range of, of people in terms of uh, in construction and the visual arts and with children um are there anything from all those edge conditions that you're starting to see in yourself over the last six months um i don't know i suppose one of the things I think when you're talking about edges being, um, and Ashling is talking about edges, and we've all been kind of discussing this idea about it being about connection and interaction. Um, I think the point about kind of diversity and inclusion that Jane brought up was really important. Um, and I suppose, I think we're all here talking about architecture also, um, and that's really what 
being a practitioner of built environment is about is how you translate how you can translate interactions between people into built spaces so I think that's something that's kind of there's been new ways of thinking about that um, and I suppose the other thing that's like the elephant in the room is um, climate climate questions and that's something that I think all of us have probably been thinking about within the last six months and the new types of boundaries and types of day-to-day -day practices and types of edges we've been setting up. Um, I don't know when um, it's interesting, I, I've been looking or thinking a bit about um, Donut Economics and the work of Kate Rayworth, um, who runs Donut Economics Action Lab, um, which talks about trying to understand how we can put uh, human activity into what she calls the donut, um, which exists between the planetary boundaries or the edge of what we can do and still have a habitable planet um, and the bit in the middle, which is like the whole of the donut, which is the kind of social boundary and within which we can live a, a, a comfortable, healthy, happy life. Um, so I think there are those wider issues of, of boundary and edge that, that I've probably been thinking about a little bit um, more introspectively over the last six months as well. Um, and thinking about the new patterns that, that people are developing and how, how there's a bit of hope in that um, as well. Lovely, thanks. Yeah, absolutely good wider, wider perspective. Um, uh, Jane. Hi. Do you want to share on those wider perspectives? What has been exercising you in terms of um, uh, of architecture of the wider um, boundary conditions um, over the past six months? Um, I suppose quite a quite an obvious one would be the access to and quality of outdoor space, public space that's inside but also outside. Um, I think that's never been so obvious to so many people um, when they had that access taken away temporarily due to lockdown or um, the distances which we were allowed to travel in order to be outside. Um, and just I think really there, you know, this is starting to um, feed its way not only into local planning conversations but also small practices. We have colleagues in Belfast who have just uh, collaborated together with a number of businesses and um, local bodies to experiment and test how you know car parking spaces can be made into parks. Um, and I think all of these um, opportunities that have revealed themselves over the last few months and the appetite for you know from from the general public to you know make better spaces and make more green spaces. Um, I think is really starting to gain some momentum um, and being taken seriously by um, the people who are able to commission them on our behalf. Um, so I think there, there you know, will be a lot of um, changes, small perhaps, but um, important really in how people value those public spaces when they do get back into them again. Um, and really that, you know, architecture does affect how we experience our cities, our towns, our <laughs> villages, our coastlines, um, and that's really we deserve to have, you know, even the smallest bench that we sit on, um, have a bit of thought and care put into where it is and what it feels like when we sit on it. Good, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'm conscious of uh, no questions from the floor, but uh, um, I think it's really interesting maybe to follow through on some of the individual passions of the of the various um, uh, of the various participants. Um, I suggest maybe Ashlyn, if you can share a little bit. Uh, I mean, it is a it's an area of uh, passionate interest. Um, what do you see as some of the the wider agenda issues that um, Tara had picked up in climate change? Jane had picked up on a change of open spaces and spaces for families and uh, to go out and uh, and enjoy um, the uh, out with of uh, the climate that we're currently working in. Um, what are some of the bigger 
bigger passions uh, that uh, exercise you? Uh, uh, I'm again <laughs> we're at flummox is our answer, but um, so it makes it eight o'clock on Sunday night. Um, I, I like. I mean, my I, I am really pretty passionate about uh, boundaries and contested space. That's kind of you know the peace walls I've been studying for ten years now, um, and just ways to you can you know, like erode the divisions in our communities um and i do you know like architects have been responsible over the years for the concretization of division with not just the walls but the um you know the, the way that roads have been planned and houses and buildings that turn their back in certain areas and that's, that's harder to take away than the um the walls themselves actually and not the walls aren't easy to take away uh, and then increasingly i'm interested as well from my research in in the border, you know, I, I suppose, again, I suppose I've always been quite interested in that and it's become more topical recently, but so those kind of scenes in our environment and our built a natural environment and how we how we build connections across those, maybe that makes me seem like a bit of a one trick pony, but that I'm very passionate about that. And as one of the people that I um, researched, one of the women that I researched in Israel, Palestine described, um, you know, she was an architect who practiced like I do, uh, uh, you know, residential projects, but also um, did a work with uh, in a local in a sort of local Bedouin community. And she said everything she does is about community and connection, whether it's a house for two people or working in a like the UNESCO Heritage City of Akko on tourism projects. It's all about community. Um, I kind of share that. It's all about connections and it's all about community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashlyn. So it is. It's about it's. Uh, dare I say it? It's a Brexit and a shared space on a on a wider agenda. Um, uh, I think we're we're prompted that um, we we close up soon. But I'm very keen to uh, to maybe extract in such a very short time. Uh, in terms of uh, Tara, can you want to come back on that uh, on that boundary of of climate change and your your interest in in that area? I'm conscious. Uh, to give people a chance to see a little bit of your own passions and um, maybe out with the other two panelists. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I suppose um, that issue overlaps with all the questions that um, I suppose the subject matter and the research of free market um, and the idea of, of looking at towns as um, somewhere that is has huge potential in terms of future sustainable living. So that has been one of the kind of hopefully um, continuing areas of research of that of free market and the work that will come out of it. Um, and I suppose I'm just always interested in asking questions um, and in questioning the ways that we work, the ways that we live together, the ways that we uh, set up practice and projects. Um, and so that's really just about questioning the ways that we live and thinking there are changes we need to make um, and that there are ways that architecture can prompt those changes. And that's kind of what I'm interested in, I suppose. Thanks, Tara. Uh, I'm conscious time, time is too short to explore all of your things. Jane, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit. Uh, do you want to share a little bit in, in closing on those that your passion for the public space? And I know you have, uh, you're engaged with the RIBA and they have a, a huge number of agendas in terms of how the regional um, uh, offices engage with this uh, at a regional level. Can you share uh, with us uh, your work on that? Um, well, I suppose that the, you know, climate and um, reuse um, has been very much part of conversation at both Reba and RSUA. Um, and on a personal level, I've been taking that into our studio teaching. Um, my studio I run at Queen's is called In Praise of Adaptation and really is looking at, you know, those sort of overlooked places, towns, um, outdoor spaces older buildings that um, quite often people feel that retrofitting is not appropriate or too expensive or not achieving what they want and really asking um, you know, the next generation of architects to think first about how we might adapt and reuse um, and um, think more holistically about sustainable communities and buildings and our role that we have to play in that. 
And is that something, um, Jane, how can we, uh, we be part of that? Or how can we engage with that as, as architects and particularly in the universities? I think that just really having that, you know, our you know, desire as architects probably is to, you know, build and build new, but actually we're, we're sort of working at a sort of slower pace and maybe the last few months have encouraged people to think more reflectively about resources we have already. Um, I suppose really that's the starting point is mm -hmm. that we adapt and, and, and change what we have. Yeah. And Tara, can I, can I ask, how do you see uh, education and engaging with students on these issues is, uh, is uh, the opportunity there to do that? And how um, do yeah, I think um, it's interesting, I suppose, teaching can be something that is like um, a sci an extra thing to practice from for some people I suppose oh, it, the model is often that architects are practitioners and they also teach and I think um, for lots of people that's a really um, productive relationship to both sides and I think one of the things that um, somebody once said to me and I was having a discussion about teaching and we we started to talk about teaching as actually an activist practice and it's the way in some ways it's a, a way you can be very political and activist and you can really impart um you can have radical conversations and you can really try and question things um and obviously you're it's a two-way process between students and and um teaching and learning or whatever but um i think that's something i've always held then that it actually maybe is one of the most radical parts of practice that you can hold um and so uh, certainly you can engage with these questions a lot uh, through through um within the space of the of the of education thank you thank you Sarah. and um uh, ashlyn um i'm conscious as a practitioner and ashlyn's disappeared as a practitioner um how do you see best you can your world uh, start to make changes or start to change views of planners or start to change views of policy makers in how we um, address these changes, both in terms of boundaries and in terms of day-to-day -day, um, inquiry. Was that a question for me, Martina? Sorry, my yes. Zoom cut out and I only <laughs> I vanished off the meeting and I'm just back on. So I heard, how do I, sorry, could you just ask the question again? So just as, as a practitioner, uh, how do you see your work uh, and how do you see your approach uh, impacting policymakers and planners and all of those that you have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you see your role in impacting change through those conversations? I think you know a very clear like that project that i showed we that we did earlier this year was the first time we'd worked with doj on a, on a project and it's likely that they're changing the way that they um kind of do this work and they're doing it all centrally now moving forward since lockdown so it's probably possibly the last time we'll work in that way with them and i feel completely okay about that because i feel like what we what we like to do is go in somewhere you know, got to go in there and try some stuff and maybe by trying some kind of wacky things and seeing how they work that might influence other people to try and do engagement talking to people in a different way and meanwhile we'll go on and tackle another thing or look at a different place in a different way Um, so I think uh, you know keen not to just find some approach to keep rolling it out but keep trying mm. new ways collaborating with new people tackling new challenges uh, and that's I mean that's how architects treat every project isn't it you know nobody wants to be doing the same project over and over again every new brief new client new set of design team comes out with a different solution and it's the same I think with yeah so with policymakers, just hope to mm. try new things get it out there and hope that it influences the way people, things are done more broadly from the top down yeah yeah good thank you thank you very much Ashlyn um, uh, thank you very much for everyone coming this evening. I'll pass over to Frank, maybe to, to wrap up for Architecture at the Edge. But thanks to Jane and to Tara and to Ashlyn uh, for, uh, for their presentations. And, um, and in a very short time for sharing some of those uh, insights um, at a broader level. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Martina and, and everyone. I'm 
the sun has set here in Galway. You can probably can't see me at all. Um, but um, thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful uh, end to the, the weekend. Um, and I really enjoyed the presentations and, and I hope to see you all again in 2021. And uh, take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank and uh, Martina. Thank you also um, to Thanks. Frank and Martina and Jane and Ashley. It was great. Yes. Lovely. Lovely. Lovely to hear your presentation.